Are you here? Well, <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here for this. Welcome, everyone, to the four underrated Jimmy Buffett songs from the 80s, a commentary. Yes, indeed, from the Paul Leslie Hour. Take it away now, Paul, if you please. Jimmy Buffett's most famous songs were written and recorded during the 1970s, but some of my personal favorites originated in the 1980s. Previously a solo songwriter, Buffett was increasingly writing songs with some exceptional co-writers. While continuing to record songs in his own distinctive style, he began exploration with new instrumentation. I'm going to look into four fabulous but underrated Buffett songs from the 1980s. I went for the deep, deep cuts that have hardly or never been performed live and didn't appear on the Boats, Beaches, Bars, and Ballads box set or the acoustic Songs You Don't Know by Heart re-recordings of rare songs that came out a couple years ago. I'll share what attracts me to these songs and also have some quotes and audio comments from some of Jimmy Buffett's co-writers, Michael Utley, Marshall Chapman, and Will Jennings. I'll also be featuring some words from serious record collector Frank McInvale. With so many underrated Buffett cuts from the 80s, narrowing it down to just four was no easy task. I may leave out one that you feel is underrated, but what do you say we get to it? When the wildlife betrays me is a true tear in your beers pleading. In my eyes and ears, it's a sad country song. Is the song full of desperation? Yes, but haven't we all been there? Jimmy Buffett described the song to Sergeant Dick Fellows on the radio show Country Music Time. We wanted to write a good honky-tonk, beer-drinking, late-night closing song. Michael Utley, one of the co-writers of the song, called to check in and share his recollection of the song. My recollections, it was written, uh, Jimmy and I and, and uh, Will Jennings wrote this album. Uh, it's Riddles in the Sand, I think. Is that the album it's on, I believe? Yes, sir, 1984. Yeah, exactly. And we, we were in St. Bart's. And uh, my recollection is Will brought the title. When the wildlife betrays me, it was apropos uh, for uh, you know it it's as uh, I guess for the times and uh, I mean not from a personal point of view but just from you know to, to write a beer drinking song <laughs> and uh, I you know musically I was I didn't I wasn't really involved with the lyrics it was really Jimmy and Will. I can tell you a little bit about, you know, recording it. We cut it in Nashville, and uh, Reggie Young played the solo on it, and uh, that's, uh, you know. Utley went on. Jimmy is such a talented writer, and sometimes he doesn't get the credit he, he, he deserves, but these tunes are so well written. I can't find any documentation of Buffett performing When the Wildlife Betrays Me live in concert. That's not to say that the song doesn't have its admirers. The late Peggy Young, wife of Neil Young, was inspired to record the song on her debut self-titled album. Peggy explained to Doug Waterman, I never heard Jimmy Buffett's version. Will sent the song to my producer, and I loved it. It's fascinating that Peggy Young recorded it, but never heard Buffett's version of the song. My guess is that the words got her. The character of the singer is putting it all on the line, just like the song says. Whether or not you consider When the Wildlife Betrays Me country, I think it's extremely well-written, soulful, and I would consider it very underrated. I believe a country artist could and should cut it, even today. I'm going to talk about a vastly underrated Buffett song. It's only been performed live once. 
Beyond the End is the last track on the last Mango in Paris album and makes for a most intriguing epilogue. Before the lyrics, the liner notes make use of a passage from The Lonely Silver Rain, the very last novel by John D. MacDonald. The adventurous character Travis McGee explains, We are a long way from anything. Even that statement is captivating. Is it actually possible to be a long way from anything if you're anywhere in the world? The lyrics live in an eerie continuum of place and time. It's certainly an unusual song, as are many songs born from literary inspiration. The Lonely Silver Rain would be the last book by John D. MacDonald. Buffett wrote Beyond the End with Marshall Chapman and Will Jennings. One of my regrets is that I didn't record the brief phone calls I had with Will Jennings, not only because of the content, but his intriguing cadence. Jennings expressed his fondness for the last Mango in Paris album, and in particular Beyond the End. I had the chance to speak with one of the co-writers, Marshall Chapman, one of my favorite people to listen to, whether it's singing or speaking. Her milieu has been described as where stories meet song. Let's let her recollect the setting where this great Buffett song was written. So we, we were in Key West, and I think that was where the idea beyond the end came from. We all felt like, you know, Key West is sort of the last stop. It's sort of beyond the end. Yeah. Places like Key West. So we were thinking about Key West being beyond the end. You know, Mayan Moon. I think that was the first line. I think that was. Uh, yeah. But I remember that Mayan. We, we would go have drinks. We would write, you know, I love Jimmy just doesn't want anything. He, he just he'll go play golf and then come in and write for two hours. And that's it. Like in Nashville, people sit there and just have a brain drain trying to force a song, you know, and just sit there and stare at each other. These co-writing sessions for hours and hours, 10, 12, 13 hours. Jimmy, two hours, hit it, quit it. So um I love that about him. And then, so then we had a lot of time to play, but always we'd knock it off. We'd, we'd write in the afternoon and then we'd knock it off and go to Louie's backyard, which is the most beautiful it's a really good restaurant, but it's got this dock out in the ocean, and, and it's the closest point on all of Key West to Cuba. And it's, we would watch this. We would be having cocktails, of course, and watching the sun set. And there's this magical time when the sun's setting over water. I see it off my dock here at Pauly's Island. There's a moment where the water becomes lighter than the sky. Right. You know, it, it just shimmers. And it was just a magical, magical time. But the fact that, you know, that sign was there, it's like next stop, Cuba. That's what, kind of where Beyond the End came from. You know, when, when we were at Louie's backyard, we felt like we were sort of beyond the end. Quite a picture she painted. You'll notice the crucial use of other vocals on this track. Yes, that is the late Roy Orbison you hear closing out the record. Will Jennings told me that Orbison's vocals are the perfect way to take the listener beyond the end. A year after this recording was released, novelist John D. MacDonald passed away, and just over three years later, Roy Orbison passed away. Beyond the End is an otherworldly song of continuity conjured by Jimmy Buffett, Marshall Chapman, and Will Jennings. It reminds me of the Robert Williams service poem, The Call of the Wild, especially the passage, Let us probe the silent places. Let us seek what luck betide us. Let us journey to a lonely land I know. There's a whisper on the night wind. There's a star agleam to guide us. And the wild is calling, calling. Let us go. Floridays from 1986 is the album that followed Last Mango in Paris, 
On it is Nobody Speaks to the Captain No More, which for my money is Buffett's finest song. Doesn't it feel literary in nature? The song took inspiration from No One Writes to the Colonel, a novella written by the Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez in the 1950s that was published in 1961. The story was undoubtedly the catalyst for Nobody Speaks to the Captain No More, with Buffett inscribing, For Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Ali Fox, and Phil Clark on the liner notes. Ali Fox is the main character in the novel The Mosquito Coast, and Phil Clark was the real-life inspiration for the classic song A Pirate Looks at Forty. Frank McInvale, a serious record curator, has a personal connection to this song. In his collection, McInvale has every original Jimmy Buffett vinyl record, and that includes Down to Earth and High Cumberland Jubilee. He weighed in on what the song means to him. The song Nobody Speaks to the Captain No More, I listened to repeatedly during a turbulent time in my life. I was getting divorced. It was very stressful. One of my only solaces was lying on my couch in my sunroom with headphones on, listening to old Buffett songs, albums, on vinyl. And that song in particular spoke to me because it's about getting older. It's about being not as useful to people anymore. It said to me that even though you're going through this, you'll be okay. There was a lot of emotion in that song, a lot of feeling in that song. And it made me feel better. It actually gave me solace. It is undoubtedly sad, but it was a sad time for me. Just, I guess, knowing that there was other people that felt that same way at times in their life would give you solace. If you haven't read No One Writes to the Colonel, I humbly suggest you find the English translation and read it. It's not long. Like Jimmy's masterpiece, Nobody Speaks to the Captain No More, it's a reminder that sometimes the hero gets knocked around by life. The people who appear to be indestructible quite simply are not. Heroes often fail, as the great songwriter Gordon Lightfoot wrote in the song, If You Could Read My Mind. I think if I ever had the pleasure of hearing Buffett sing this song live, you'd see me pinching myself. The 1988 Buffett album Hot Water had a more contemporary sound than all of the albums that came before. It represents a bit of a departure, and the material and production seem more experimental. One song, Bring Back the Magic, written by Buffett and Will Jennings, features some really surrealist lyrics. The subtle accordion-like sounds coming together with the Neville brothers and Rita Coolidge sets the perfect mood. You'll notice the lyric, Beachcombers ride, O children lost in the tide. That line is a wink to the painting, Ride of the Beachcombers by Noel Rockmore. Buffett said, I bought the painting and sat with it for a morning in New Orleans and let the town talk to me. If you ever have a chance to look at Ride of the Beachcombers, you may make some connections. The artist Rockmore was born in New York City and made a name for himself in New Orleans. From the Big Apple to the Big Easy, he painted hundreds of jazz artists as a unique way of documenting them. I admire Bring Back the Magic, and in some fashion, think of it as a tribute to an artist. The presence of the painting in New Orleans are felt in the words and music. Most of all, we can't be reminded enough that although hurting is unavoidable, the magic will come. I think Buffett's recordings from the 1980s are underrated as a whole. I'm so grateful and pleased by the reaction I got from the 1970s piece, and hope you like this one too. Before we go, I'd like to mention a couple honorable mention selections. If I could just get it on paper, which I think about whenever I attempt to write something. In my head, as I drive down the street, it sounds better and feels like it will be easy. But even writing a review is difficult, and my respect for anyone who writes is abundant. 
Then, of course, there's That's What Living Is To Me, where Harry Belafonte and Mark Twain find themselves at a junction. It's all the more interesting to me that Belafonte's first album was entitled Mark Twain and Other Folk Favorites. I love an interesting connection. Well, that's all I've got. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Buffett songs from the 80s you feel are underrated. Just comment, okay? Should I explore my four underrated songs of the 90s next? Come on, you know I'm going to. Until next time.